Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I'm Eve Engler. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I'm coming to you uh, from uh, Jojage, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. Uh, I guess happy Labor Day to everyone. Uh, here, it's a little too hot. I hope it's not too hot wherever everyone is uh, tuning in from. Uh, we have a special guest this evening, but before uh, having uh, speaking with Tamara Lawrence, uh, well-known anti-war activist, researcher, uh, some updates on Canadian foreign policy. Of course, the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour is a uh, critical discussion of Canada's role in the world. Former global news reporter, Rachel Gilmore, who is sort of prominent, very prominent, gets the ire of all these uh, sort of hard right wing uh, types online. Uh, she was uh, let go at Global, I think maybe three, four or five months ago. And um, big, very big uh, social media following. She posted a couple of days ago uh, that um, <clears throat> one of the toughest spikes of my career career was my profile of Shireen Abu Akle. I had interviewed the cameraman who filmed her murder, as well as two other Palestinian reporters who knew her. Really wish I could have published that one. Didn't say anything more than that, but presumably she did a report on uh, the slain Palestinian journalist killed by the Israeli forces and uh, Global uh, spiked that. So uh, uh, obviously a very small example of uh, the anti-Palestinian bias in the dominant Canadian uh, media. Karen Rodman, who was on last week, she published a piece uh, a couple of days ago on Rabble titled, Canada Complicit with Annexation of East Jerusalem, that goes into a bit of what Israel's doing with, with uh, uh, taking over East Jerusalem, cleansing Palestinians, and uh, Canada's uh, uh, complicity in that. Newfoundland, put up a, a quarter million dollars a couple of days ago uh, for a multi-year fund to, to being described as to combat anti-Semitism. It appears that the money goes to some initiatives that B'nai B'rith is going to, to um, oversee. And the article about this uh, it mentions a couple of things. One, that Newfoundland Labrador um, adopted the IHRA, uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's anti-Palestinian definition of anti-Semitism. A little while ago, and that also the money is in, in response to uh, the formulation, I don't have it in front of me, but it was quite a good formulation, um, uh, activism that's angered the establishment Jewish community. Of course, what they're referring to is pro-Palestinian activi activism, so they don't, they don't ever say exactly what, what, they're, what it is, but it, that it, it's, it's anti-Semitism because it angered the establishment or the, uh, they didn't use the word establishment, the uh, leading uh, Jewish community organizations or some, some formulation like that. Not untrue, but very misleading. Um, um, there's uh, ceasefire.ca in their weekly uh, send out, they point out, uh, which I'd, I'd, I'd thought of and I didn't really kind of pursue, Human Rights Watch about uh, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, uh, reported that Saudi border forces have killed hundreds of people trying to cross the border from Yemen, refugees, migrants, uh, mostly people from uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, and apparently this is, you know, it sounds terrible, very brutal. And uh, I've seen some stories that said the Americans have been aware of this for a while and, and sort of kept quiet about it. And, Maybe Ottawa is known, maybe it hasn't, but, but the point that the ceasefire.ca uh, highlighted, which is important, is that the Canadian light armored vehicle sales, we, there have been, they've been going to Saudi border forces. Um, so, you know, who knows what that means exactly in a direct complicity standpoint, but um, we know that at minimum we're arming, we're selling arms to the force that's killing uh, large numbers of, of, um, of migrants that are apparently just literally trying to cross the border. And I'm presuming here that the Saudis are doing this 
is a way to deter uh, further migrants, uh, which is obviously a very horrific, um, a, a horrific uh, affair. Um, a Iranian media outlet had a story about uh, Pierre Poliev titled uh, Canada's Prime Minister Hopeful Vows, Vows to Kick Out uh, I IRGC and Regime Thugs. So apparently Poliev made a speech that's really aggressive. We're going to you know, kick out the Iranian regime thugs of Canada from Canada, um, which is just more of this sort of bombastic kind of line that's uh, all over the Canadian uh, political uh, um, um, culture dominant politics. A, an Iranian, another Iranian media reported a story that MEK members, this, this came out a couple of weeks ago, but MEK thinking about trying to move its base to, to, uh, to Canada. I wrote a story about this. This is a group that we used to consider a terrorist organization and how it's sort of now become very popular with major Canadian political figures. This story says that the because Albania has been moving on the MEK, which they've been based there since 2016. They were based in Iraq for a long time, and then apparently the Americans uh, worked to get them moved from uh, Iraq to Albania, and now Albania wants seems to want them gone or wants to make life difficult uh, for the MEK in Albania, and so they say two separate groups of MEK. Some are going to be moving to Germany. And the rest going to uh, to Canada, uh, so we'll see where this uh, where this all goes about the MEK. But it is pretty fascinating the turnaround from a group that was dubbed a, a terrorist organization in Canada to a group that's increasingly uh, has operations uh, and political uh, 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 support in this uh, in this country. Owen Shock on Canadian Dimension has a, a good story titled, As West African States Take Greater Role in the Mining Sector, How Will Canada Respond? So there's obviously all these, these sort of um, clues that are framed as, uh, as nationalistic in a number of different um, uh, former French colonies, particularly in, uh, in West Africa. And, um, and so it's a little bit unclear where this is all going. Uh, it, clearly, there's an anti-French uh, ethos that's growing steam in the region. How far these, how much this is just rhetoric and how much it's reality is not clear. But uh, as uh, Owen goes into, uh, and I mentioned it, I think, on a previous session, the um, Malayan, um, um, uh, Mali's government just uh, increased the, the uh, uh, royalty rates on mining companies where huge Canadian mining operations. So any real nationalistic kind of uh, uh, political movement, government, military regimes, whatever, whatever you want to call this exactly, um, they will invariably be pushing to get a, be a greater uh, bit of the you know, benefits from their natural resources or you know, put better restrictions to lessen the ecological damage and maybe even you know, ideally in some cases probably just keep, keep the, the minerals in the ground. Um, but but um, so we'll see, and that's sort of part of what Owen goes into in this article and the huge amounts of, of resources uh, Canadian capitalists, how much money Canadian capitalists have um, in these countries. And so they're clearly following this very closely and, and, and quite, quite concerned. Uh, and I would presume the Canadian government, as I've said before, you know, central thing that Canadian government is concerned about across uh, Africa, most countries, its predominant concern in Africa is the, can, the interests of Canadian uh, uh, mining companies. So Ottawa, of course, is following these developments fairly closely from that, that perspective. Um, now, of course, the military stepped in in Gabon uh, after uh, what appears to be a dubious election to, um, to uh, push out the Bongo uh, candidate, who is the son who's been uh, part of the family dynasty that's been running the country for 55, 56 years. And uh, I, I certainly don't know much about Gabon, and, I, and, I, and Canada doesn't have 
from what I can tell, a uh, very significant uh, uh, role in the country. Uh, now, it, it appears there's, there's, there was an election there and, and uh, the opposition candidate is saying that, that he actually won and that he's the rightful uh, leader, not this, the military officials, include, which include apparently a cousin, uh, uh, a cousin of the Bongo, uh, in the Bongo family that is apparently now leading things. Um, but the Canadian government uh, put out a statement right away uh, saying Canada is deeply concerned by the situation in Gabon and calls for a quick and peaceful return to democratic and inclusive civilian led government and for respect of the rule of law. Now, that statement seems to me way too close with with uh, um, with the, the Bongo family. I, I mean, clearly there, there's been there was serious ballot stuffing in I think it's the 2016 election uh, that almost for sure lost and uh, and just basically stopped the ballots. And it appears in the most recent election, a uh, similar dynamic was at play. So, so you know, there's sort of not, there's been sort of nominal democracy, but really it's been a one family that's been running things now for more than half a century and, and has apparently pillaged huge amounts of, uh, of resources. And, and basically for most of that period, been very close with Paris, very close with France, and um, and increasingly sounds like close with the Commonwealth and with with the with the U.S. So the Canadian uh, statement about rule of law, civilian led governance, uh, you know, that's a very uh, cherry picking kind of uh, kind of framing of what's what's going on. Also, Trudeau spoke with um, the chair of uh, ECOWAS, the president of, uh, of Nigeria, the, the day or, or uh, about 24 hours or so after uh uh the military intervened in gabon and um and uh, and, he, and raised gabon uh with the president of ECOWAS, the nigerian president and also raised uh, uh niger and and of course ECOWAS has been you know nigeria brought in sanctions uh cut off i think it's something like 70 percent of uh niger's uh uh um electricity and uh, and has been threatening an inter a, a military intervention to restore the ousted uh, the ousted president, and um, and so uh, so Canada has has been clear had it been clear was was clearly backing ECOWAS and and this uh, this meeting between Trudeau and uh, phone phone conversation between Trudeau and the Nigerian president reinforces that and also kind of frames uh, what's happening in Gabon uh, a little bit in that same light so. I think what's clear in all of this is that France is being widely challenged by in its former colonies. That that's that's unequivocally clear. In Niger, there's been big protests at the uh, at the French base where there's about 1,500 French troops in in recent days, and and um, and so they clearly want French troops out. Uh, they seem a little bit uh, more accepting of the U.S., uh, which I'm not sure that that's going to be. A uh, I, that I think is interesting politically. I, obviously, French power has been predominant in these countries, so I understand why the focus would be there. Uh, but I do think that that uh, I, I don't think it's to be. It's not an impossibility that the U.S. Um, is okay with a little bit of this anti-French kind of position uh, because it can maybe lead to the U.S. actually having more power. Uh, nonetheless, there, Canada has clearly aligned with with Paris to a certain extent, and uh, and Washington, obviously, on both Niger and Gabon. Um, when when it seems like in both cases the the military's role, while I think we always have to be very cautious of the military, um, it, it's the military's role seems a little bit unclear. In, in Gabon, the stepping into to, to uh, to push out the Bongo family seems like basically a good thing, even if it's designed to somewhat maintain elements of the previous regime. Uh, but also, and I think in Niger, what we're seeing is that there is clearly a fair bit of popular support for uh, the military intervention. Even again, I don't. I think that you know a, a dubiously elected president still has better democratic credentials than a a uh, the military or the presidential guard. Uh, but nonetheless, it seems like at least at minimum, it's a complicated situation, and Canada is pressing, I think, uh, very much in the in the um, 
in the over overdoing the the um, the clarity of the situation in backing um, foreign intervention and uh, and uh, um, the like. Um, with regards to to India, the the um, uh, the uh, there's reports that Canada is halting its trade talks with uh, uh, with India, which is interesting. That's an interesting development because that India has become increasingly tied into the the uh, the uh, anti-China policy and to sort of marginalize China. Uh, the Globe and Mail published a editorial op-ed. I think it from the, the head of Justice for All, a, a Muslim rights organization in Canada, titled Ottawa is walking a tight rope into the G20. The G20 is being hosted by, uh, by India, by uh, the president there. And the story kind of goes through uh, basically how uh, the Bodhi government is very um, anti-Muslim and how Canada is, 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 is getting closer with, with India, despite it's, it's very anti-Muslim. And, and to, the, to their credit, this is rare, points out that it is a, quite a contrast between the policy on India versus China, because the claim is that we're, you know, we're isolating China partly because of poor treatment of Uyghurs, yet this very bad treatment of Muslims in, in, uh, in India. Now, the story doesn't the, the op-ed doesn't say that, in fact, the treatment of Muslims in India is much worse than the treatment of Muslims in, 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 in China. It doesn't go that far. It won't go there. Um, but it kind of hints, it hints at, at how bad the situation is in India and, um, and kind of highlights that contradiction, which I think is an important uh, uh, contradiction. It, it speaks to how it's the geopolitics that's shaping things, not the concern about, uh, about Muslim uh, uh, rights. Uh, the the stars and stripes the the american military uh publication points out that the three canadian naval vessels i believe i talked about this last week the three canadian naval vessels that have just been dispatched to uh they've been in japan recently and they're going to be there for i think five or six months in the region they are going off in i, I this was the story of a couple of days ago so it may have already gone off uh as part of operation neon which is targeting uh, uh, sanctions on, um, on uh, North Korea. And this is that operation that the Canadian government tries to frame as a UN mission because there are UN sanctions on, on North Korea, but there is actually, there is no UN mission. There's no UN approved uh, force to enforce those sanctions. And the Canada and other countries have just taken that upon themselves. Um, and so uh, those, those, are, those naval vessels are not there primarily because of North Korea. They're there primarily to stoke tensions in the uh, in the Taiwan Strait, and it, the Taiwanese uh, newspaper had on its front page uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday uh, how Canadian naval vessels all across the front page of the paper. I saw an image of it on Twitter. I of course can't read. Uh, I can't read um, um, the uh, Chinese letters, but but um, uh, the the person who can't presumably correctly translated it uh, said it talks about Canadian uh, naval vessels uh, going through the Strait of Taiwan, they're there to stoke tension on that issue, uh, which is a very dangerous uh, uh, question. But Canada has, has committed to, uh, to uh, supporting the U.S. In, um, in rising, in trying to basically uh, provoke a conflict. The Globe and Mail on uh, a couple of days ago, front page, had this story titled, China works to sow doubts about Japan allies with disinfo disinformation campaign against nuclear water release. So the Japanese, of course, uh, have been releasing the, uh, the water uh, from the uh, nuclear disaster from, uh, I don't know how many years ago that is now. Uh, they they're, ha have released it into the ocean and there's obviously lots of concerns about what this is gonna do to the fish and, and the like. And the Globe put this on the front page and basically, it's they're kind of framing that you know opposition in South Korea, and and elsewhere, including in Japan, tons of concern within Japan. Uh, I don't know the science of this well enough to know about how bad the contamination is going to be, but on the surface of it, uh, this seems like a bad idea. And um, 
and basically the, the Globe's publishing this piece saying it's China, you know, stoking all this, this environmental concern. Now, what I found interesting about this is not that they, they, they published this story, uh, just kind of more, you know, China is responsible for all the bad things that people think of, you know, wherever, uh, but it's actually a New York Times story. And it's not that common to put a front page article um, that's from another you know, publication. Uh, uh, so it just speaks to how down the path of like demonized China, the Global Mail is that they'll put a New York, the story was also on the front page of the New York Times. They'll put that on the front, uh, front page of the paper, which is you know, kind of, you know, it's a little bit embarrassing for the Global Mail to, to be putting on your, your front page a story from from another uh, uh, publication. Um, so, the as part of this this anti China uh, developments, we have a uh, um, story that Michael Chong, the conservative uh, uh, foreign affairs uh, critic, is going to be testifying to the U.S. Congress about how China has been interfering or has been targeting him. Uh, so we'll see what that all means. But this is just all this is like now he's really reached the big time, right? Chong gets to go talk to American legislator, legislators about how he's been a victim of the big bad Chinese. Um, so this this continues this this kind of dynamic. Now, there's a fairly significant development, uh, I think, on the anti-China kind of uh, um, campaign in this country. And on the front page, of the Saturday Global Mail business section is a big story titled Ottawa Cracks Down on Wealth One Bank. And, and this is a bank, uh, I think it said something like $400 million in assets, not very big. It's a, a Canada based, it's not that old. I think it's like seven, eight years old bank. Uh, it was approved, I think, 2016 in this country. It was set up primarily by these three uh, Chinese Canadian uh, capitalists, wealthy. I don't think they said exactly how wealthy these people are, but, you know, in, you know, not maybe not the upper echelons of Canadian capital, but capitalism, but, but, you know, significant Canadian capitalists, all of Chinese descent, of course. And all three of their images were on the front page of the, of the Globe and Mail. And and it's it's uh, Bob Fife and Stephen Chase who are the two main kind of like, you know, China is is taking over Canada, um, Global Mail uh, people who very you know the, they've been the voice of CSIS and and whatnot, and uh, and in this story which is based ostensibly based on access to information uh, thing they, they first of all they make it very clear that it's it's um, Christian Friedland that's the player here driving all this. And she's, it says, uh, finance minister forces out founding investors with alleged ties to Beijing and imposes national security conditions on bank. And, and, it, and it details like some of the things they impose on this bank. And this is stuff that's like, like this is, you know, this is, uh, if, this was a, <laughs> if this was a leftist government in, uh, in Venezuela or Bolivia or Mexico doing this, this would be viewed as like, whole, you know, we'd have front page stories about the attacks on uh, these communist attacks on uh, private enterprise and stuff like that. And so they, they um, first of all, they forced these three founders to sell all their stock, to get off the board. That apparently happened a while ago. And they've it strengthened these conditions, have nothing to do with the bank. Um, and then they go into everything. It goes, Freeland has imposed on Wealth One vetting of all banks' employees. Relo relocation of its Toronto headquarters to new secure premises and sweeps of its corporate property for surveillance devices. The banks prohibited from using the Chinese social media messaging app WeChat for banking business. So like all these things, forcing them to relocate, the, you know, sweeping of, of like, you know, monitoring devices or whatever of their offices, uh, just really extreme uh, conditions on this bank, they're basically making it very clear that they think this is like a Chinese government. Uh, I'm not sure what, but Chinese government, you know, nefarious Chinese government thing in Canada. Apparently, it's mostly a bank, of course, for Chinese Canadians. Uh, I don't know much about the bank itself, but this to me seems like a big step up in going at uh, Canadian capitalists, obviously of Chinese descent, 
who um, have ties in China. And, and this is, of course, where this is going. And I think this is, would be designed to scare other Canadian capitalists, probably principally of, of Chinese descent, but even you know, non-Chinese uh, 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 descent individuals, who, of course, would be you know, less vulnerable to this kind of these claims of being you know, Chinese agents. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, I think this is quite an quite a important step forward. And we have to remember that Freeland was the one who, who, um, who really went on with the Meng, Meng Wanzhou and the imprisonment of Meng Wanzhou and the importance that played in, in, um, in, in deteriorating relations. And I think there's clearly divisions within the cabinet, uh, Trudeau himself and others who were less on board for the anti-China stuff. So I think Freeland is probably making a play here and, um, and we'll see where this, where this, uh, where this goes. Now, the Globe and Mail published a piece, a really horrendous, colonial, racist, imperialist piece on Haiti. That's just, it's just unbelievable that they, they continue to publish this stuff. And it's by uh, Robert uh, Rotberg, who's the founding director of the Harvard Kennedy School's program on interstate conflict and president emeritus of the World Peace Foundation. And they publish him. They publish him on Haiti uh, six months maybe ago. Another really horrendous piece. But they publish him on other things on like Africa related stuff. And he's it's, it's just this total like do gooder colonial kind of figure. Now the column uh, begins with Ottawa and Washington need to intervene forcefully to save Haiti from itself. That's the opening line. Towards the end of the column, it says. To move forward, Haiti should be made a ward of the UN. Okay, so here's a publication um, calling for it to be made Haiti to be made a ward of the UN. Now, I'm not certain of this, but I don't believe the auto or the Global Mail has mentioned the Ottawa Initiative on Haiti once since it happened back in 2003. Now, of course, part of what they announced the plan in the Ottawa Initiative in Haiti, where Canadian officials brought US and French and OAS officials together to discuss over, overthrowing Haiti's elected government. Another part they discussed was making Haiti, uh, a, you know, making a UN trusteeship. And that of course happened. Haiti was effectively a ward of the UN from 2004 to 2017. And UN still has, quite a bit of influence, is still ongoing mission. So here you have the Globe Mail calling for this, but they won't ever, you know, publish something. I mean, maybe they've mentioned Auto Initiative on Haiti once, maybe. I'm going to look into it when I have a chance. Um, I'm pretty sure they haven't mentioned it, but maybe once, maybe twice maximum over the past 20, 20, uh, 20 years. Uh, so this is just this, you know, colonial uh, attitude with nothing about actually what's what Canada's done in Haiti, uh, but what the U.S. has done in Haiti. Uh, it's just unbelievable. And, you know, it's also unbelievable how little reaction there is. There's going to be no, there's nobody, you know, from Black Lives Matters movement or, or you know, Black Solidarity movements in Canada are going to push back on this. This is basically nothing. There's a handful of activists in the Haitian community, maybe, that will push back on this. It's just it, it's open season on this kind of stuff. You know, the, the NDP is calls for Canada to be part of the core group. The core group, you know, oversees Haitian affairs. Um, so this is, you know, kind of more of what we're seeing. Uh, really unbelievable, though. Uh, on the Haiti file, uh, Minister Jolie met with the uh, EU co-president. Uh, is it uh, Charles Michel or Michel Charles? And they said that the tweet said they discussed EU expansion in the Balkans, the conflict in Nagorno Karabakh, and the next steps to address the crisis in Haiti. These conversations are key to Canada EU relations. So Melanie Jolie is still going around the world, uh, prodding governments to intervene, to get engaged in Haiti, and calling this a key to Canada EU relations. Uh, and of course, we had that mission of of um, Dominican officials to Canada to talk Haiti. Uh, they met with the tourism minister a couple of days ago, or maybe it's a week ago now. Uh, now shifting gears, getting uh, 
setting up to, uh, to have uh, Tamara come on here. Um, the, the Calgary Stampeders put out a, an article saying stamps honor military at Labor Day. So they have the big Labor Day CFL games today and they, the, um, the uh, uh, Calgary Stampeders are gonna be honoring the uh, military. Uh, we have in Toronto, the air show with all these uh, Canadian American and other military aircraft flying over a big sort of fighter jet propaganda exercise. Uh, there was a story in the out, um, is it the uh, Outlook, I think it's called, um, uh, Lookout, sorry, Lookout newspaper um, about uh, the Alberni Museum and Memorial. Uh, one of, it's one of these uh, Department of National Defense uh, museums. They had an uh, um, exhibit for uh, Canadians who fought in, in uh, Vietnam. And uh, the, uh, the story and the lookout newspaper is, so this is a DND museum that's being covered by a DND uh, uh, newspaper. And I should just say to get a sense of the, there's about 60 of these DND museums that receive funding and space from, uh, from the military. And they, as the came forward to say, the role of CF museums is to pre preserve and interpret Canadian military heritage in order to increase the sense of identity an esprit de corps within the CF and to support the goals of the Department of National Defense. Just, it's just part of the, the propaganda, the huge propaganda apparatus that's at the air shows, that's at the, the CFL games, that's at uh, you know, public relations in universities, its own university, its own history department, its museums, on and on and on, uh, its own publications, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so that's a, obviously always an important part to remember how big this, this propaganda apparatus of the military is. Now, specifically about this museum, celebrating the more than 20,000 Canadians that fought in Vietnam. The story in the newspaper says, the military newspaper says, the memorial contains the names of 149 Canadians who were killed in Vietnam while serving with United States Armed Forces seven soldiers missing in action, two Canadian military personnel killed in action while serving with the International Commission for Supervision and Control, and two Canadian soldiers who were reported MIA with the ICSC who were not volunteers fighting with the U.S. military. Uh, Ron Purvis, Canadian Vet Vietnam Veterans Association president and founder, organized the traveling memorials visit uh, to, to Alberni and said the names are unknown to most Canadians. Um, so. More than 20,000 Canadians fought in Vietnam. We're now celebrating that at D&D Museum. We have a Canadian Vietnam, Vietnam Veterans Association present, probably funded by the military. I'm not sure of that, but probably they get some funding from the military. And, um, and this is, of course, uh, well, only one element of Canada's role in Vietnam. We had diplomatic support for the war in Vietnam. We had uh, spying on the North Vietnamese through the International Control Commission for the US. Uh, delivering U.S. bombing threats to North Vietnamese, uh, uh, testing U.S. chemical weapons to be used in Vietnam, and of course, huge amounts of Canadian weapons uh, 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 sold to the U.S. that were that were used on 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 Vietnamese. And so, um, this is just a little bit of of Canadian uh, military history. And now, uh, 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 tomorrow, I'm going to try to bring you up. Uh, to oh there you are it's just uh, uh first of all uh tomorrow th I'll, I'll unmute you um so most of you are probably uh, familiar with Tar tamara lawrence well-known canadian uh activist anti-war activist researcher and uh i thought um i would just uh uh have um have you on to discuss a few uh uh military related things. Uh, first of all, um, the Brent Patterson published a story titled Parliamentary Budget Officer to Release Cost Estimate on F-35 Warplanes in October. Total cost could reach $90.4 billion. And you, you've done some of the you know, best, best work in this country on opposing Canada's purchase of the F-35. And can you just give a little bit of an update on um, on you know this the now this the, the cost looks like it's gone up another 15 billion from the already high cost that the the anti fighter jet coalition 
had had um, had come to the calculations. Uh, but yeah, just a bit of update on the F thirty five and you know there's the cost overruns and all that stuff. Okay, uh, thanks, E, very much for having me, and hello, everyone. And before I jump in and talk about the F-35 and my trip up to Cold Lake, I want to say happy Labor Day and express my appreciation to everyone who works so hard in the labor movement to protect uh, workers' rights. And also, I want to give a shout out to uh, Greg and to Murray, who I believe were out on the streets today in Toronto to protest uh, the air show. So right. Uh, over this weekend at the Toronto Air Show, Canada's CF-18s were flying overhead and, you know, they're they're very noisy, releasing air pollutants and, and carbon emissions and uh, traumatizing people. And um, it, it's a, just another expression, you know, by the Canadian Department of Defense of national defense to glorify war and militarism. And we need to continue to work hard to uh, oppose it. But, you know, it's interesting, a week before, before Brent released his article about hearing from the Parliamentary Budget Office that they are going to be releasing a report in October on the F-35s, I had actually contacted the Parliamentary Budget Office, you know, just after I returned from from uh, Cold Lake, and I asked, you know, when they are going to be releasing the latest cost estimates on the F-35. And they said to me, it's going to be sometime uh, this fall, but they didn't specify that it would be uh, most likely in October, the information that they gave to Brent. And it was in 2012, 2011 and 2012, that the Parliamentary Budget Office had done uh, cost estimates at the uh, about the F-35. This was at the time that the Harper government was planning on buying these fighter jets. And right when the PBO released its cost estimates at the time, uh, they were so high and they revealed that, that the, the Canadian government was not being honest with the public about the, the cost of these fighter jets, that it led to the government not being able to go through with this purchase. And so I really believe that when the PBO releases uh, his latest cost estimates, that this will be an important opportunity for us to, to protest this procurement and to stop it. And so, you know, we need to mobilize this fall. We need to get organized. The other thing that I learned when I was up in Cold Lake was that the community has not been consulted on this purchase. And this is, in, the, the Air Force Base and the Air Weapons Range are on Indigenous territory in Cold Lake, Alberta. And uh, as many people know, Canada has uh, ratified the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In fact, we have an act that, that you know, has made this a, a official law in Canada. But but the indigenous people there say that they have not been consulted about about this purchase and about the new fleet of F-35s coming to their community. And so this, I think, is an is another important angle for us to, you know, to push the federal government saying, you know, you haven't even consulted with the indigenous people who are so adversely affected already by the Air Force base. And so. Uh, you know, those are just, you know, some of the important hooks for us to to stop this purchase. The other thing that I want to bring to people's attention is that in May of this year, the U.S. Government Accountability Office and last year in uh, in April, the GAO released two important reports about all of these problems that are plaguing the F-35 program. Now, the F-35 is the costliest weapon system in the history of the United States, and it's going to be costing up, upwards of $1.7 trillion. But the GAO, in their reports from last year and this spring, said that uh, the, the F-35 has a problem with spare parts, a problem with its engine, a problem you know, with production delays and and uh, cost inflation and a lack of accountability. They don't know where uh, millions of parts are. 
and they're really alluding to corruption uh, in, in these reports, I'd encourage people to look at them. They also say that the production is, you know, 10 years behind schedule, and there are, there are over 800 open deficiencies. And there's also a problem with the cooling system. These, these fighter jets are, um, are, are, are overheating, and there are also crash risks. So I brought all of this information uh, to Cold Lake. Um, and, and Eve is, I'll, how about I just jump in and tell people a little bit about my trip there. So I have been to Cold Lake uh, three times in the past three years. I've been going annually and I was there about two weeks ago and I was there to give a presentation about a report that I did last year for the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Canada, WILP Canada. The report is called Soaring, the Harms and Risks of Fighter Jets and Why Canada Must Not Buy a New Fleet. And that report is up on our website. And I wanted to bring to people's attention, you know, how uh, all of these problems with the F-35s, but also the real concern about the noise level and the, and the crash risk, because these F-35s are even noisier than the current fleet of CF-18s. And so I did a talk at the, uh, at the um, public library and um, we had a nice little turnout and I had copies of the report and I went through my presentation and the people in the audience said that they this what I presented really concerns them because already that they they are experiencing you know the shaking of their houses and the fact that they can't talk or or you know listen to music or to television when the the the, the CF 18s are flying overhead. Um, this is a low level training area up in Cold Lake, so the fighter jets can fly a hundred. Uh, feet. This is about 30 meters over the ground. So they fought, fly, you know, continuously all day long, really low. They're practicing maneuvers. When I was there, they were doing, you know, practicing, uh, you know, three fighter jets at a time. And uh, so people said that they're worried about uh, the noise because it's already very noisy. The indigenous people said to me that they're concerned about hearing loss in their community because, it, and they blamed the fighter jets. They're also concerned about air pollutants uh, from these fighter jets. Some people told me about cancer on uh, on uh, the on the the how in the among the population that's really close that lives really close to the air force base, and. Um, and they're concerned as well about, you know, the cost, uh, the federal government spending all this money on new fighter jets when there's all of these pressing social needs in the community. And and, and that aspect is, it, it, it is very hard to hear and it's very hard to, uh, to see, to see the poverty and the people struggling with, you know, addiction in the community. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Cold Lake is uh, 300 kilometers northeast of Edmonton. And uh, the, the Cold Lake Air Force Base is uh, the largest, busiest Air Force Base in Canada. There are 15 wings, and this is four wing Cold Lake. And not only is there an Air Force Base there, there's also an air weapons range, which is about 50 kilometers outside of the town away from the Air Force Base. The Air Force Base is right in the center of the town. And um, it's 3 million acres of land. And th this year marks the 70th anniversary of this land being stolen from the Dene and the Cree, Cree people. When I was up in Edmonton, I went to the provincial archives, the, the, the archives of Alberta, and I looked at the original documents that were signed by the federal government and the province of Alberta to transfer this land uh, to national defense to establish this Air Force base. And none of the documents even mention the indigenous people, but this land that Canada is practicing uh, their, their, their um, air maneuvers, they're, they're bombing sacred, sacred traditional land where there's burial sites, where there's their traditional hunting and gathering uh, sites, where they had summer camps and winter camps. And when the, they lost possession of this land in 1953, 
they were only compensated for the first few years very minimally and then received no compensation for decades and then they had to fight very hard to get a land claims inquiry but the the loss of this land uh, was absolutely traumatic for the people so the people in cold lake the indigenous people they account for about maybe 20 percent of the population about 3,000 indigenous people are there in cold lake a population of 16,000 people and um, when I was up there, I always go to the Cold Lake Friendship Center and the Cold Lake First Nations Friendship Center. And Thursdays is when they have their soup and bannock. And you can go and have lunch and interact with uh, the, the local community. And so I went and I had the soup and I had the bannock. And then I saw that there was a crib set a cribbage set next to an, an older indigenous man and I asked him if he wanted to play a game and he said yes let's play a game of crib so we played three games uh he, he beat me um two out of three and uh, I mentioned to him that I was giving a talk in Cold Lake later that night about the Air Force Base and his face went from smiling at me as we were playing this game and he was beating me to scowling and he just looked at me and he shook his head and he said we hate the air force base they stole our land and um i think that most canadians don't know the trauma that has been inflicted by the by the department of national defense to indigenous people for air force bases and military bases and these air weapons ranges and our elected officials who have signed off on this big purchase of F-35s have not gone up to Cold Lake to see what the impacts will be of this of this procurement. So we need to do a lot more to raise awareness about the problems of the F-35s coming to Canada and especially coming to these indigenous territories. And it should be noted that all kinds of different NATO countries use Cold Lake and they have all kinds of exercises up there and, and uh, um, assist uh, uh, fighter jets all around the world, bombing and stuff. Um, we we don't have that much time. There's a couple other things I wanted to I wanted to, me, to maybe touch on. So I just saw that the the uh, uh, Andrew Leslie, I think, is the former chief of the mil, uh, the army. The CBC has an article saying Can Canadian military needs dedicated climate disaster force. Former army cam, uh, army commander says. Um, I just wanted you to maybe, uh, you know, talk about that or respond to that um, before maybe mentioning some of the upcoming, I think there's some upcoming mo anti-war mobilizations. Uh, so I would agree with uh, former Lieutenant General Andrew Leslie that we need a rapid response, natural disaster uh, team, but it should be out of the Department of National Defense. It be, should be completely demilitarized. Uh, we know from the wild fire services from, for instance, Alberta and British Columbia, that they do not have enough human power. They don't have enough uh, forest firefighters. They don't have enough water bombers. And so we, you know, those are the kind of investments that we need to make. But quite honestly, it's Canada's investment in the past 25 years in carbon intensive militarism and in wars that have derailed us from uh, decarbonizing over the past two decades and, you know, creating cl climate resilient communities. And now we're seeing the impacts of you know of these decisions and the, the last person that should be advising uh canadians on on you know how we deal with with uh the, the climate crisis is the military because the military is has been has been the worst offender i mean the canadian military uh, accounts for 61 percent of all federal government emissions if the federal government were serious about the climate crisis, we would be demilitarizing, we would be not buying a new fleet of, of fossil fuel powered fighter jets, you know, for upwards of $90 billion. In July of this year, the federal government also announced an investment of $3.6 billion in strategic tankers, 
those are aerial refuelers that are going to fly alongside of these F-35s to refuel them because they have such a limited range and they're so heavy. And so uh, we are locking ourselves into carbon intensive militarism and we need to demilitarize to decarbonize. So we need to get this right out of the Department of National Defense. We actually need to you know, seriously talk about dismantling the Department of National Defense because it isn't providing the true uh, t- you know, type of security, human security that we need and natural defense that we need. We don't need militarized national defense. We need natural defense. We need investments in protecting our forests and our and our water and, and cleaning up toxic sites. And most of those toxic sites in the country are military sites. And, and, and ensuring that our communities, are, you know, are more resilient to be able to fight off, you know, extreme... Uh, heat waves and heat domes. I mean, so many Canadians don't have uh, uh, don't have air conditioning, and there's more homeless encampments across the country, and people are suffering. I was just at the homeless encampment in my community yesterday, and they're living, you know, in tents with this sun, you know, beating down on them. Right now in Waterloo, where I'm living at, living in uh, the temperatures is 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 38 degrees it's extremely hot we've had record high uh heat in this country we've had unprecedented heat uh fire forest fires we we need to stop these investments in carbon intensive militarism and start investing in 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 climate justice in renewable energy on a just transition and just just to before, but I, I want to just you could quick update on the uh, upcoming mobilizations. Two things I just want to say and maybe mention if you want to comment, go ahead. But let's try to keep this brief. Um, one, people probably saw that the defense minister in Ukraine was removed. And another thing that that I wanted to highlight is that the U.S. is sending uh, now sending depleted uranium munitions to uh, to Ukraine. So that's a, a further escalation. And I think that the defense minister being removed is speaks to the fact that the counteroffensive is is failing. Um, but simultaneously, the Americans are into uh, escalating with with the depleted uranium. Um, and in that context, or actually, one other thing I want to mention before, you, if you could just comment, upcoming mobilizations is um, is uh, the Socialist Caucus, the NDP convention, the Socialist Caucus. I was just sent a bunch of the resolutions they prevent presented. Uh, a couple around uh, Palestine, NATO, peace. Um, anyways, going stuff going in the right direction. So just to, to put it on people's radar that there is some, you know, within the NDP, there's some anti-war kind of anti-militarism, um, interna- social justice internationalism being put forward. But yeah, if you could just comment on any of that and also just mention upcoming mobilizations. And then I know Hans wants to uh, ask a question. Yeah, the war in Ukraine is escalating. In July, at the Vilnius NATO summit, uh, countries said that they were going to uh, start supplying uh, Ukraine with F-16s. And our foreign, uh, our, our former uh, defense minister Anita Anand said that Canada would be training Ukrainian pilots on flying the F-16s. And the the F-16 is a dual capable plane that's able to carry nuclear weapons. So, you know, this is another escalation. And this is another way that this war in Ukraine is uh, exacerbating the climate emergency. And and um, it's countries like the Netherlands and Denmark and Norway that are you know going to be supplying uh, Ukraine with F-16s and Canadians should know as well that these F-35s that Canada is planning on buying are also dual capable planes that are able to to uh, carry uh, uh, the B-6112 a tactical nuclear weapon so uh, the NATO countries, including Canada, are wanting to prolong this war, which is diverting resources away from the climate emergency and dealing with the poverty crisis and locking us into uh, carbon intensive militarism. So it's so important for us to not only stop this F-35 purchase, but to also stop this war in Ukraine. So we are mobilizing in Canada in solidarity with 
the uh, global mobilization to end the war in Ukraine. This was called by the International Peace Bureau, and it was an outcome from the really important International Summit for Peace in Ukraine that was held in Vienna in June that I attended. And so uh, there's this global mo week of mobilization that's called from September 30th to October 8th. But because September 30th is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, it's Orange Shirt Day in solidarity with Indigenous peoples, uh, we are calling the Week of Action in Canada to be October 1st to October 8th. So we are hoping that Canadians will plan actions, really public actions, to get out on the street to say, peace now stop the war in Ukraine and stop NATO. And you can find out more information about that at the Canadian wide Peace and Justice Network. And the URL is peaceandjusticenetwork.ca. So information will, will be going up on, on that website and just urge you to plan an action where you are. And we're gonna be uh, releasing more things, uh, webinars and an action to put pressure on the Canadian government to to uh, uh, call for a ceasefire and negotiations to end this terrible war in Ukraine. So thanks a lot for that. Um, and I'll uh, leave, open it up. But just mentioned, I saw an email from um, Mouvement Québécois pour la Paix. I think it's October 2nd. There's going to be a mobilization here in Montreal, if I'm not mistaken. But so I think the different cities are already coming up. But um, so I have... Um, I'm, I've I've uh, go ahead hands. I have uh, made uh, Laura a co-host. Uh, if there's any issue, but I, I think you can go ahead hands. Okay, can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Good. Um, Tamara, you mentioned uh, one of the resources we need to fight forest fires is bombers, water bombers, and um, so I've got a little sign here for you. Water bombers, not F-35 fighters. <laughs> And the other side is uh, fight GHG, not World War III. And I plan to proudly participate in the October 1st demonstrations. <laughs> and I have more of those signs if anybody wants them. Uh, by the way, uh, yes, those signs were also effective in protesting against Julie uh, De Bruyne, our uh, Danforth NDP Liberal MP. And they helped me win my uh, anti-war resolution in the Beaches East York NDP Riding Association. Uh, not by a hell of a big margin, mind you, but I think it's possible to transition the fight against these uh, overblown, overpriced, unreliable fighters with the burning need to fight forest fires because we do get rate, uh, satellite data where uh, fires begin and by dispatching uh, water bombers quickly to them, we can fight these fires before they get out of control. And let's not forget the simple fact, the boreal forest is not only a lung for the planet, it is Canada's most sustainable economic resource. So uh, I encourage us to focus in and try to link the climate justice movement with the anti-war movement. I think that uh, these slogans help to do that. Your comments, please. I think Tamara is muted. Tamara, uh, are you muted? Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, thanks, Hans, very much for your, your activism. It's desperately needed. Uh, one other thing that I discovered, you know, going up to Cold Lake and looking at uh, the archives as well, is that is that the, the the fighter jets, when they are doing their practicing of launching missiles and dropping bombs and you know targeting, uh, they actually can create forest fires and it is boreal forest and the boreal forest has become degraded in that area because uh, because of this militarism so it's it's also the home of care of the caribou of the boreal caribou but this this animal is now endangered and one of the reasons is because of the air force base and also because of the oil and gas development and uh, the cold lake 
air weapons range is part of the tar sands development. There's a pipeline and there are big uh, drill wells and oil tanks that are on the land. So the, the, the land has been so traumatized by this militarism and by this extractivism. And, and these fighter jets are actually, you, you know, can cause forest fires. Um, so it, it, so it, it, it's just absolutely ridiculous that we are, we are investing in, in a department and in, and in a weapon system that is, you know, can cause forest fires and that's exacerbating climate change when communities in Alberta in the spring, starting in May, you know, were evacuated and there were hundreds of homes and, and businesses burnt down because there were over a hundred forest fires that were raging in the province in May and June. 30 of them were out of control. There are still forest fires burning. Uh, so, you know, we're not out of the woods on this. It, 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 this just shows a total lack of, um, it, it, it shows how you know, militarized our, our government is, the total lack of priorities, and it's so irresponsible. I also want to bring to people's attention that September 15th to September 17th is the is a, is a global weekend of action to end fossil fuel. So this would be a really fantastic time, friends, to bring your signs and to to walk alongside the environmental movement to say, you know, no fossil fuels and no fighter jets and you know, no more of these 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 wars for oil. I mean, we've got to stop the wars to help stop global warming. Okay, thank you very much, Tamara. So Yuri. Can... Yeah. Uh, thank you, Laura. Thank you, uh, Eve, and thanks, thanks, Tamara, for all the great work you do. Uh, some of my quick questions are: uh, Eve, has how has Quebec uh, corporate media, state media, been covering, responding to what's happening in Niger, Gabon, and Senegal, and in African affairs in general? Or do they very much follow a pro-French, pro-Western imperialist line? What's happening in Yemen is is the Western backed Saudi UAE assault still happening in that country, or has that stopped since China more or less brokered peace, brokered a truce between Iran and Saudi Arabia? And to both Tamara and Eve, are any indigenous groups or notable indigenous voices in Canada starting to speak out more on Canadian imperialism, militarism? I know Eve, you you kind of spoke out a bit on. On Black Lives Matter and other racial justice groups that, that that are often quite silent, but any improvement on any kind of you know racial justice groups, social justice groups, or even eco justice environmentalist groups when it comes to speaking out on Canadian imperialism? Yeah, I mean, just quickly on the uh, Niger and and uh, Gabon stuff. I, I mean, they, they, Le Devoir runs uh, Agence France Presse stories, and La Presse does as well, um, I believe. Um, so they're, you know, a little bit more follow the Paris line, but I don't think, I, I don't see a pretty, I don't see a significant distinction between the French language media on this. And I'd say even to some extent, when there's, you know, deeper coverage sometimes that can actually lead to better coverage and i would say there is a little bit deeper coverage probably in the french press on 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 this um and um yeah so well, with regards to canadian imperialism uh, in terms of you know indigenous um response uh, i mean i think that there's there are examples of of um in really important and good examples of indigenous solidarity around like Canadian mining companies abroad and um, delegations going down from, you know, uh, First Nations leaders here that have been, um, I think, uh, uh, you know, good signs of, you know, solidarity that, you know, against communities, uh, indigenous communities in, in Guatemala or Ecuador being, being uh, you know, undermined or destroyed by Canadian mining companies. Um, but but at, at a more big picture level, as I've as I've mentioned uh, previously, there isn't there isn't much resistance coming from um, from uh, you know indigenous or for that matter you know 
a lot of like you know Black Lives Matters sort of movement, if you like, on something like Haiti that that ostensibly should be an area where they would want to um, want to um, uh, you know challenge the racism of Canadian foreign policy. Can Can I also add, uh, Eve, about um, about uh, Indigenous uh, people and in Canada and in solidarity with um, uh, you know things that are taking place around the world. I when I was at the the Cold Lake First Nations uh, Friendship Center, I picked up a copy of the latest Alberta Native News. It's a, a newspaper that comes out um, monthly, and the the headline, the front page story, was about the fact that in July, the Treaty Six uh, uh, chiefs throughout the province had called a state of emergency because of uh, because of the opioid crisis and um and and the poverty crisis in in the province for indigenous people so the article states and i just want to read this line as of 2021 first nations male life expectancy is 60 years compared to 79 years for non-First Nations men, while First Nations life expectancy is only 66 compared to 84 years for non-Indigenous women. There's a gap of about 20 years between Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, people for life expectancy. So uh, there are real serious struggles for Indigenous people, not just in Alberta, but right across the country. Um, there aren't even paved roads on most of the reserves in Cold Lake. They don't even have a tribal school. Um, they, they, there are so many pressing needs for them, you know, around water, for instance, uh, across the country. And so for, we need to be in solidarity with Indigenous people. And, and this is one of the reasons why we have to like cancel this fighter jet purchase reduce military spending and say it needs to be invested in indigenous community for true reconciliation and we need to to know the truth about the theft of this land as well so the people are suffering and we need to appreciate this um i i, I yeah and i also uh, want to say too that uh, 10 years ago there the indigenous people in cold lake they had a hundred kilometer walk because there the pipelines were leaking um, on on the air weapons range, and it was you know see, uh, leaching out into the water, uh, and there there is so much you know uh, toxic uh, water and toxic air because of the the tar sands, the oil and gas development that's really close to the communities. And I just want to encourage people to follow the excellent journalism of Brandy Morin with Ricochet. This indigenous reporter who's doing really great research about how the tar sands um, and all of these social issues are adversely in, impacting indigenous communities. Thanks. Okay, we have two more questions, Joan and then Sandu. Joan, go ahead, please. Um, I, I was wondering, excellent work, Tamara. Wonderful what you're doing. I was wondering about if you could comment on something we hear over and over again. The new, the new normal, and then people are so concerned about what's happening now. They're starting to focus not on the causes as you're doing, but on adaption, adaptation, saying well, you know, we've got to protect ourselves, but and, because it's the new normal, and and I think it's I I think we've got to counter this in so so many ways because it's it's a normal it's a normal response that people would have is. Is, it is a disaster and what they want to do is try to protect themselves, but they protect themselves in the best way by preventing is what you're, what you're talking about, preventing the problem. I wonder if you comment on that. I agree with you, Joan, uh, um, that, uh, but I would, I would add that um, we are not even adequately adapting to, to the, the climate threats that we that we know about like we are, we are not even helping communities adapt to 
higher temperatures and and forest fires and drought and and water scarcity it, um it's it's ridiculous that we are wasting any money um trying to protect the the naval base in Esquimalt or the naval base in Halifax from sea level rise you know we need to be getting rid of these military bases giving the land back because military bases are so degraded and you know they really contribute to the climate and environmental problems and we're not even Canada is not even helping developing countries that are the least responsible for the climate crisis adapt to uh, adapt to these extreme uh, weather events. So Canada and the other wealthy countries in 2009 made a commitment to spend $100 billion a year to help developing countries adapt to climate change. But do you know that we have never met that $100 billion target? Instead, what the wealthy countries, these are the, the countries of NATO, what they've been doing is massively increasing military spending. So they have spent annually $200 billion more combined on their militaries. And they keep saying, well, they don't know where the money is going to be for this $100 billion for climate finance. So we are not, uh, uh, we need to talk seriously about demilitarization so that we can adapt uh, to deal with the climate emergency that we are in right now. But we also need to be honest, like you said, Joan, about the root causes. And it's the fossil fuel extraction and it's all of this fossil fuel powered militarism and wars. We need to stop the wars and we need to, to stop global warming. Okay, yeah, and great sign, Hans. Uh, okay, Sandhu, can you go ahead, please? Uh, yeah, I was just uh, Eve, uh, bring the discussion back to Gabon for a second. Um, I think it's you know Canadian uh, bilateral trade with, Can uh, with between Canada and Gabon is actually not even twenty million dollars, so it's it's not really uh, a big player in that sense. But I think we have to look at it from a broader geopolitical perspective, and especially the Canada UK US alliance. So I think you know that in last year, I think it was in July maybe that Togo and Gabon became members of the Commonwealth. And the Bongo family has been extremely close to Prince Charles. Uh, it also, Gabon also is the uh, one of the, I think it's probably the, it is the number one uh, IT uh, communications and, uh, and technology, information technology backbone hub for Central Africa, uh, all run by the US. So there's a, there's a, a bigger kind of an angle uh, with respect to the, call it the Anglosphere or, or NATO or whatnot, of which Canada is a member. And I, I think that helps understand uh, why we're, you know, in it as opposed to just looking on, on you know, trade and things like this. So I don't know, what do you, if you've thought I, about I, this? I, 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 I fully agree. I think that's exactly right. Uh, I think that Ottawa's position coming out right away and, and basically criticizing what on the surface of it, I mean, it's pretty hard to argue that the military intervening, basically the military, the, the presumption was the military was going to be asked to repress demonstrations opposing the uh, election uh, uh, ballot stuffing. I mean, that was essentially, and instead of doing that, they, they, they took control. Now, whether that's a backdoor way of continuing the bongo regime I, that may be the case it seems like there's some evidence that may be what's happening but but nonetheless i think it, it speaks to the bongo uh, family being illegitimate and so canada coming out with a statement right away sort of suggesting that they weren't illegitimate is i think you're exactly correct and why ottawa would have done that which is that it fits within the the sort of nato the fact of joining of the commonwealth there has been, it should be noted, there is competition between the U.S. and France in Africa, right? There, there is, Rwanda is an example of that, where there is competition between, it has been different periods. And, um, and, uh, and so uh, Bongo family joining the Commonwealth, I think, had been moving a bit more towards uh, uh, the Anglosphere. Um, but, but I think that the big picture is that the Canadian government is happy with the African continent in general, 
um, West Africa specifically having, um, you know, sort of run by these sort of corrupt pro-Western rulers and, um, and efforts to sort of challenge that are basically uh, not well perceived in, with the decision makers in Ottawa. If there is one last question by Alan Hansen, can we take that? Yeah, let's try to do that quickly, if that's okay. possible. Okay, go ahead, Alan. Uh, yes, uh, I grew up um, an hour from Edmonton in the direction of uh, Cold Lake, and uh, 60 years ago, and possibly even more, in the early 60s, uh, uh, I recall seeing exactly what you talked about, those jets screaming over, and I had to put my fingers in my ears when they when when they were coming. I remember that very clearly. Um, yeah, another thing that, well, uh, and we went on demonstrations to, there was a demonstration from Cold Lake. Uh, I didn't participate in the whole thing against, uh, I've forgotten the name of those uh, particular uh, missiles that flow, flew at a very low uh, altitude and went from side to side. Uh, and they were testing them here, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, of course, there were a lot of demonstrations, but that carried on. Um, but one of the things about this expenditure on um, on uh, armaments uh, been going up and up and up. And uh, uh, probably tomorrow, uh, when you came through Edmonton, you would have witnessed something that I, a phenomenon that has increased in very recent years in Edmonton, the numbers of people that are both begging and homeless. And Alberta probably still has, uh, thanks to the boom, the 20 year boom that took place, probably still has the highest incomes across um, uh, across Alberta compared to the rest of Canada. So I just wanted to toss this in, the inequalities and everything the way it's done. Uh, Alan, thanks for your remarks. Uh, ju so just a uh, just a, a few things to say about that. Um, uh, uh, so not, not only are these fighter jets, you know, flying uh, so loud and low over the land, they're, they also dump fuel sometimes and if they if there's uh, if they're concerned about their landing and potentially crashing they'll dump fuel over the forest and all on the and mm -hmm. over the lake this is what some of the indigenous people have told me so just further degrades uh the natural environment it makes it less able to deal with you know to deal with climate change and um, has adverse impact on people's uh, ability to you know to use the land um and you were talking about the 1980s the cruise missile test protests um uh, so when i was in cold lake i went to the museum and as eve was saying in his opening uh, remarks. He was talking about the Department of National Defense and all of the museums that it has across the country. Well, D and D has a museum in Cold Lake, and it, it's only been recently that there has been added sections to this to this museum because two thirds of the museum is focused on the Air Force uh, history in the area, and now and then they added over the past uh, couple of decades they've added small sections to the museum about the heritage and about oil and gas development and a small room on indigenous history. Of course, there's nothing about the theft of the land in 1953, nothing about the land claims inquiry in the early 1990s, um, uh, which showed that the, the federal government and the provincial government had had, uh, you know, caused the communities to, uh, you know, be so destroyed by losing their land um but uh, uh yeah the, the museum did have a small display about the cruise missile test uh, uh protests um and that was the only thing about peace or anything that was opposing what the air force is doing most mm -hmm. of the the displays at the museum is showing you know the good things that the air force is doing you know it says Canada's operations worldwide are is promoting peace and freedom in the world. Well, it's doing the exact opposite. We have to think about what the Canadian Air Force did to uh, Libya in 2011 and in Syria and Iraq, bombing those countries. 
and, and then just to wrap up to say last November, I was in Egypt for the climate summit. And remember um, that, uh, and, and, and when I was there, many Africans were telling me how, um, uh, you know, how outraged they, they, you know, they are about what NATO did to Libya, a country right next door to Egypt, you know, uh, killing civilians, destroying infrastructure and making it more difficult for Libya to to deal with the climate crisis. They're facing sea level rise, you know, and a humanitarian crisis and and more dust storms and drought and desertification. And many Africans say said to me because they were Africans uh, you know, from across the continent that, that were mobilizing there for climate justice, a just transition. And they also talked about they don't want the West militarizing Africa any longer. They want AFRICOM out of Africa. They want NATO out of Africa. Next month, October, Black Alliance for Peace has their big campaign, shout, shut down AFRICOM. And I want to encourage you to support that campaign because Again, friends, you know, we need to end this militarism if we're serious about dealing with the climate emergency. Mm -hmm. One last comment, if I can. Uh, earlier in the program, it was mentioned about 20,000 Canadians that partook in the Vietnam conflict, Vietnam invasion, but on the part of the Americans. And uh, about 25 kilometers from Edmonton, is a there is a chemical plant in a place called Fort Saskatchewan. That chemical plant produced all of those exotic things that were dumped on Vietnam: uh, napalm, defoliant, uh, uh, defoliants, and uh, whatever other uh, uh, things. Mm -hmm. uh, must have made billions upon billions upon billions of dollars. That sole plant for uh for dow chemical thank you was, Alan. yeah thank uh, you Alan. thank yes thanks so, thanks so much that's really sad and uh dismaying but um thank you very much tamara and eve that was a great session uh, i appreciate so much your work uh tamara thank you any final words eve and tamara no, no thanks thanks everyone Oh, well, thanks very much, Eve, for having me. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, there is a really great book uh, written in the 1970s by a Canadian nurse. She was a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. Um, it's called Why is Canada in Vietnam? And she revealed that uh, Canada was supporting uh, the U.S. war effort uh, illegally in the country. And she went on a big uh a protest and hunger strike in front of parliament. And it was also good for us to rem remember that important history. You can find that book online, Why is Canada in Vietnam? So um, we have lots of work to do this fall to, uh, to bring about peace. Make sure you get involved, stay connected with the Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network. And um, yeah, uh, have a great September. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.